guys, what's up? Haru. Finally, we're getting Arlequino. But this Arlequino isn't the graceful and friendly fourth harbinger that we've seen before. This is the true wolf that would even betray her own Archon if it was quote-unquote absolutely necessary. Necessary being to fight with her own children and the possibility of harming a lot of members from the House of Hearts so she could find a new king. So in today's video, we'll be going over the king of the House of Hearts in Crocabana's fairy tale, Arlequino's stance on that entire imaginary fantasy, as well as why she needs Princess Marcotte or Clervy for that to happen, even though we're not exactly sure we still have some theories. We've also got Remoria and Petricor that were hinted in much previous lore, as well as some new Sumeru drop with Sino and the High Priest of King Deshwit, Hermanubis, which could give more info on a lot of Sumeru's lore, especially the desert region of Tevat. And speaking of deserts, we'll likely be getting lore about Natlan in the form of new artifact sets, which we haven't had for about two patches already. This video will also include the short animation about Arlequino, as well as some theories around that too. So hopefully I can ease you into what you could expect in 4.6. You already know what's next, timestamps will be down in the description below for any topic that you fancy. Let's get started. Now we already know that Arlequino has her own plots different from the Fatui. But looking at the trailer, it seems like she's finally showing what she's really up to. To Arlequino, the stage is now set and all she needs is for her pawns to move as intended. But Arlequino's grand play isn't only within the House of Hearth or within Fontaine. It probably, or more than likely, goes much deeper and probably far older. The preview for 4.6 is Two Worlds of Flame, The Crimson Knight Fates. Two Worlds of Flame I want to think of is a stretch to the Conrian book, Perrin Harry. The book states that Perrin Harry, which is the main character, traversed the fires of two worlds within the hearth and that he was reborn. The preview also has this to say. All plans needs someone to enact them. May Frost blush under the crimson moon, a symphony resound from the depths, and let sand swept secrets sleep no more, till there's not but to await an inescapable fate. From this alone, we can assume that Arlequino's plan stretches to a level or probably even exceed that which the Hydro Archon Fosalor has done. Whatever Arlequino is planning to do, it extends to the people that she knows she doesn't need to control. Frost blush under the Crimson Moon may be a relation between Conria and Sneznaya, rather Piero, the Saritsa, and Conria. A symphony from the depths stretches all the way to Remoria and his Grand Symphony, to combat the Prophecy of the Heavens or Fortuna. Sandswap secrets are probably the Old World secrets after every cycle, where Old Worlds are buried beneath the sand or the ground. Finally, the inescapable fate that we can only wait for to happen, pointing towards the Hexen Circle member, Nicole's words of wisdom. People call such things fate, and it is written in the stars. It cannot so easily be altered. Are the things that you shall see different from the fate that the gods perceive? Fate shall serve as your only guide, no matter what will happen in Tevat's future. All you need to do is to play your part. Project Stuja could be one of the Fatui's projects, and it's likely related to child. Stuja means bitter cold, and is a staple weather that the people of Snesnaya have become acclimated to and are fond of. Blizzards almost don't end in Snesnaya, so if they mean to bring that perpetual winter to all of Tevat or at least Fontaine, then we're slowly beginning a sort of cold war between nations, which may lead to an actual war. But in Norse mythology, there is a blizzard called Fimbulvetr that would come first before Ragnarok occurs. TLDR Ragnarok is the end of the world where basically everything dies. Coincidentally, Skirk's master is Sirtologi, the Fowl, named after the fires of Surtur, who comes out in Ragnarok to destroy Asgard. And both Child and Skirk's abyss powers are called Fowl Legacy. So it's Sirtologi's legacy, Surtur's fire made manifest. And what does the Saritsa want? Since you endured my bitter cold, you must have the desire to burn. Then burn the old world away. A bitter cold to endure before the end of the world burns everything in its path. So if Project Stuja does happen, then we can expect even more events that lead to the end of Tevat. But a project that big is probably going to need either the Hydronosis or maybe the remains of the Third Descender. Both, I would think, Arlequino and Piero already know about. But Arlequino still has the Gnosis. 
So I think her new plan that includes the House of Hearth members as well as Princess Marcotte is what she needs to thwart her master's plans, just like Arlecchino and the Zani from the Commedia dell'Art. But who exactly is Princess Marcotte? Fremenet and what I can only assume as Princess Marcotte can be found in Fremenet's character story, Tales of the Snow-Winged Goose. When Fremenet feels different emotions, different fairy tale characters appear in front of him and to a degree interact with him, especially pairs. Princess Marcotte has long pink hair that comes to him whenever he feels timid. Fremenet knows of the time when Princess Marcotte was still a seed, and that she rode across the ocean on the claws of a crab, abandoning her birthplace for a promise of a better life. And in the animation teaser, Clairvy does the same. So it could be implied that Arlecchino is looking for her childhood friend, Clairvy. Princess Marcotte or Clairvy could also be from Snesnaya, considering Krukabena might be her biological mother. A scene in the trailer shows some eyes sneaking around Linny and Fremene at what looks to be Poisson. This could either be Princess Marcotte herself or even worse, Arlecchino spying on them. It's possible that Princess Marcotte is hidden in Poisson since 4.6 preview poster seems to be the children in Poisson. The portal itself is oddly similar to the portals that the Melusine have that go around Marusa village. Fremenet has also been searching for a way to reach and touch his imaginary world. A world where he could see all of his friends depending on how he feels. So maybe these feelings that Fremenet has are connected to places that he finds. A lonely place, a timid place, and a troubled place, similar to the ones in Marusa village inside the body of the dragon Elinus. But that would mean that Fremenet has sight that's similar to what Melusine could see, like paintings of Melusine, the sight from drinking certain potions, and gut instincts that Melusines have, especially when looking at the Traveler. The problem is, Arlecchino is already watching them along with another Arlecchino inside of her red moon pyro powers looking at the viewer. Not to mention Arlecchino glitching like she isn't actually there or is in different places at the same time. But for that, we're gonna have to talk about the short animation about Arlecchino, the Harbinger Krukabena, and her childhood friend Clervy. So Hoyo just released a short animation. The song Burning in the Embers shows off some interesting locations and events that are likely related to the trailer and the story of 4.6. First is Arlecchino's real name, Per Ware, which is kind of close to Per and Harry. Interestingly, Per Ware, if translated to Chinese, sounds awfully close to Per and Harry. Listen to this. So maybe the entirety of Per and Harry really is Arlecchino's story. If not, maybe she's a descendant of Per and Harry in some way. Second is this shot of what looks to be Fontaine as well as this arena that looks like Remoria's or the Narciss and Kreutz Orphanage or the House of the Hearth in Fontaine, which means Arlecchino is possibly from around that time period. Now we still have no idea how old or if she's immortal or not. The arena where she fought Krukabena is similar to this destroyed arena within the trailer that I think is located around here, where numerous Fatui operatives and skirmishers are also found. But their orphanage's location is still unknown. So maybe this was the same place as the animation, and could be where Fremenet first saw quote-unquote Princess Marcotte or Clervy, as well as the other possible children of the hearth he sees in his imaginary world. Third, the previous harbinger named Krukabena and a child of the hearth had a clash long ago, and it led to the latter replacing the former, leading to this animation where she stomps Krukabena. The only lead I have on Krukabena is this character named Seridwen, who is a Welsh goddess of rebirth, transformation, and inspiration. Seridwen was the mother of a hideous son named Mordvan or Morvan, and a beautiful daughter named Kreriririr, Kreri, of which Clervy, if translated to CN, is Kaleiwe, and it sounds pretty similar to Kreri. <laughs> How do you say this name? Kaleiwe. Kaleiwe. You should look at him. So it's possible that Clervy is actually the daughter of Krukabena, and Arlecchino is the hideous orphaned son. Not only do they look the same, Clervy also possesses a luminous bell necklace, while Krukabena highlights pruning a luminous flower instead of letting the entire plant wilt, which could hint to their familiar ties and is probably speaking of Clervy's death being dealt with instead of letting the rest of the hearth fall. 
which did actually happen. Arlecchino killed Crucabena and replaced her as the quote-unquote knave as a curse to bear, based on Piero. As for why she's looking for Princess Marcotte or Clervy, we don't really know yet apart from her relations as a very close childhood friend. But her childhood friend is the reason for her curse to fully flare up in the short animation teaser, as you can see right here. So maybe Arlecchino wants to see Clervy so she can embrace her curse Fully. And I think this has something to do with the emotional load that Arlecchino can manage to hold, which is why it's related to Fremene as well as the fairy tale of Crucabena. Now, the idea of kings, mothers, and fathers I think goes deeper than just a replacement for a harbinger in the House of Hearth. Technically, Perware or Arlecchino should be the one true king, as mentioned by Crucabena. Yet she wants Lenny to be the new. King. Crucabena also highlights the one true king which is the same king in her fairy tale book. And for some reason the House of Hearth back then seems to revolve around Crucabena's fairy tale book and the king of the hearth. Now this reminds me of the loneliness sickness that was in Fremenet's event if you could still remember. Now we know Fremenet has been sealing up or bottling up his emotions so maybe whenever he feels certain emotions he ends up seeing his quote unquote imaginary friends. And that his way of following orders and doing things is a wall that keeps him from his final metamorphosis. This was based on Dainsliff in Fremenet's miscellaneous trailer. Arlecchino from the short seems to also be sealing away her emotions. Her curse started to flare up when her pet spider died. You could also see this scene from the animation where Arlecchino's curse starts to flare up even more after seeing the luminous bell, which represented Clervy. And Fremenet once went to the deep sea to release his emotions where no one could hear them. There's also Fremenet's imaginary world that he one day wishes to enter. So do Crucabena and Arlecchino suffer from the same illness? Or are we going to finish Perrin Harry through Arlecchino and the siblings? Arlecchino's curse seems to stem from the same emotional problem. So maybe sealing away and releasing them is part of her curse. And releasing those emotions will lead to their true metamorphosis form. Which is what I can only assume as a butterfly instead of a spider. Since butterflies undergo metamorphosis, yet Arlecchino turns into a three-legged spider. The music also hints at freedom, wings, and fate, albeit vaguely. Arlecchino in the trailer starts with wings of a bird longing to be free. And then after maybe she shows a lot of her emotions, she turns into a spider. But to Arlecchino, she is a butterfly. You can also notice that her butterfly form is darker than the usual, which could signify her curse flaring up to the maximum degree. I could insert a relation to Mordvan, the son of Seridwin, being hideous regardless of what he does, but that's enough theory for now. Moving on, Petricor is a seemingly peaceful town known for its waterfalls and exceedingly pure waters. As to how the waters are so pure, it's still unknown, but it's located in the Nostoy region of Fontaine and holds secrets of the once magnificent nation of Remoria beneath a sea of bygone eras. Now, Petricor means golem in the ancient language and is within the vicinity of stone statues that are said to be related to the loyal army of Remoria, the Golden Troop. Remoria was once a glorious and golden kingdom that preceded the Hydro Archon Egeria's rule of Fontaine. This kingdom was created roughly after the fall of Gurabad by the god king Remus. This also happened after the imprisonment of Egeria for creating human oceanids that dwelled in Fontaine. King Remus arrived on the land of Meropis and teached humanity some basic living skills and more importantly, music and arts. Music is more or less the cornerstone and essence of this kingdom, which you can see from every aspect of their sunken eternal city. Every part of this kingdom was made with quote-unquote harmony and symphonies and was ensured to harmonize with the rest of the kingdom for King Remus and his ideals and dreams. Even so far as bestowing some of his power to a select few individuals and calling them harmosts, making them his trusted generals. From the golden instruments that can only be found within the golden palace of King Remus to the Capitolium with its overflowing melody and aromas from their musicians or the Machimos which is a famous city of warriors all the way to the kingdom's fairways that helped spread the grand symphony of Fontaine, the Symphonia Capitoli. It was King Remus's dream that brought him to create this symphonious land but it was also that same dream that drove him insane. Sadly, this kingdom fell to a prophecy similar to that of Fontaine's. 
as well as King Remus going mad because of the prophecy told by his seers. To avoid this fate or fortuna that was bound to happen, he mixed the primordial water that was under his control at the time with an immortal stone, creating this fluid called the Golden Ichor, which he then used to dissolve humans and stick them into stone golems so that they could also be immortal beings. Now such grand and regal golems of both Petricor and Remuria at first glance are actually the dissolved souls combined with Ichor now encased in these musical stone shells. It is unknown if they move with their own will using their own souls or if some form of musical magic moves them, which could be the latter considering we can make things move using music called the symphony. Now that idea didn't really go well because Remus was so hell-bent on his symphony and ideals that the local barbarians, which could have just been normal people, the Vishaps and dragons, and even the Oceanids, rose up and rebelled against Remoria. Fellow Harmosts betrayed each other, the kingdom sank beneath the sea, and all manner of life died because of King Remus's dream. Today the kingdom is still standing, but the once proud people that live there are no longer there. Only the remains of a faded golden city stand with golems that possess the souls of dissolved humans as well as the instruments and contraptions that King Remus and his musicians used to play his symphony with. But there are legends that say when the tune of the kingdom plays once more, then the golden troop, which is Remus's army, will be given the reward for their steadfast loyalty to the kingdom. Hermanubis was a priest of the Great Red Desert during the rule of King Deshret, also known as Al Amar or the Scarlet King, if you could still remember that name. Very little is known about Hermanubis apart from being the greatest of sages, but his power is still present to this day through the general Mahamatra, Sino. Now that power came at a cost of great suffering ever since his childhood, which was made more difficult since he was a desert dweller. He would have been made into a lab experiment by the higher-ups of the academia, similar to what Azar, the previous Grand Sage, did with the humans and the Samsara in Sumeru. Thankfully, he was raised as a foster son by his professor and former sage, Cyrus, who was also mentioned in the trailer. Hermanubis is mentioned as a Greco-Egyptian god responsible for bringing souls to the underworld, a syncretism or an amalgamation of the Greek god Hermes and the Egyptian god Anubis, possessing a human body and a jackal head, representing his priesthood as well as being an investigator of truth. As of right now, it is unclear how Sino was bestowed this great power or curse. But from the trailer, it seems it was through a revival ritual of sorts of either Hermanubis or King Deshret himself, and Sino became the vessel of Hermanubis' power. It also looks like we'll see a dedicated temple as well as priests who are solely dedicated to Hermanubis, which is where Setos comes in as the other chosen one for the wisdom of Hermanubis. He seems to also have an electrovision as well, which could be a reason for also being chosen. It's interesting too that Sino can return his power. Whether that means he simply gives it away or he has to lose his life in a ritual duel is still unclear. Just as a last quick segment for Natlan that I already talked about in my previous video, the people of Natlan, especially their warriors, dress to imitate their Saurian companions. Now, dragon companions in Natlan were mentioned in the talking stick, but if humans also dressed up to look like dragons, then maybe Natlan actually is a nation of dragons. In a sense that humans in Natlan are actually human-dragon hybrids. But the character design of Jensen in the Travail teaser is more of an example of humans mimicking dragons. The character Ranjit in the special program seems like the few or the only character that was able to return from Natlan, even though we barely get any stories from Natlan. Now the new artifact set, Unfinished Reverie, looks like it took a lot from Mayan and Aztec inspirations. The feathers of a Quetzal birds, which are symbolisms throughout Mesoamerica, the Mayan and Aztec calendars' sun rays and headpieces, as well as the Vibro Crystal event, which often gives lore to the later patches too. So we can hope for more Natlan lore in the future. And there we go, everything from the 4.6 special program that I could give some lore and theory for. Now, as of right now, I'm still watching the animation for Arlecchino and it's absolutely crazy. I still have no idea why she would want to find Princess Marcotte or Clervy 
but I don't know. I'll probably be making a dedicated video on that as well and will be added on the end screen once I'm done. So I'll see you guys in the next video, yeah? Like, comment if you enjoyed, subscribe, and hit the bell for more of my ramblings, and stay mad theorists. Bye!